So the ebook um, model has also proven very challenging for uh, public libraries, not just in their business model with publishers, but um, also in just the technology to deliver it, um, and in the entire in infrastructure or industry structure that has emerged to support ebooks. How many of you have ever tried to borrow an ebook from a public library? Okay, so you've got a sense of some of the challenges that users face. Right now, what's happened it, it, is it's multiplied because there was primarily, to this point, one vendor, Overdrive. Um, but now there are more coming in. And what's happened is that as each one has come in, they've replicated the Overdrive model. So they've come in not only selling content, but they sell a complete technology stack that delivers their content. So you have this very odd experience where in libraries where they're now purchasing from multiple vendors and We've just been integrating with multiple vendors at New York Public over the last 12 months. So you have this very odd situation where if you borrow an OverDrive book, and you don't know what OverDrive is necessarily as a user, you borrow an OverDrive book and you get one experience. You borrow a book that the library happened to have purchased from 3M, and they actually can be the same title, um, because in some cases with New York Public, they've purchased Penguin titles from 3M, and they've purchased them from OverDrive in the past. Um, and so you go in and if you search for it, for example, Stephen King at New York Public Library, you'll find one title that has 30 holds on it for, and another that has none. Um, so we've got this very broken model where we're creating all these silos. I think it's best illustrated with a very quick um, video here. <laughs> Um, so that, that truly is the experience um, in public libraries. And the interesting thing though, um, and it's not as we say very clearly there, it really isn't the fault of any one provider or player in the system, it's that we've designed and architected a very bad overall system. We can't have all of these vertical silos um, operating where people are trying to, and kind of randomly walking into them without even knowing it um, and not able to get back and forth between them. Um, and so that has been and continues to be. We thought we were over the big challenges of infrastructure integration, um, but we're going to continue to spend the next couple of years trying to figure this out. We tried one path, it's not working. What we're, um, and when we say it's not working, um, it, it really turned out to be a very complicated solution when we tried to integrate at all these different points with each of the vendors. 
So we're now looking at a different model and talking with a number of different publishers. It's early days, so we'll have to see how all of you respond to it. Um, we do have, when you look at the kind of public record in terms of what publishers have been saying, and this isn't to us specifically, this was um, just a general question about the idea of portable rights. But we really think that the answer lies in this idea of digital portable rights. That the, when libraries, or really, and we could extend this easily to the um, users, of course, as well. When a, a library uh, purchases a title from a content aggregator, we hope that there's a day when that th they're not required to deliver it in that stack. That they can deliver it with the best lending layer, the best reader that they choose at any given point in time. Because if you purchased it from one vendor today, that vendor may not end up with the best reader for three, three years from now. They may, they may not. Um, but we need to separate the technology from the content, which is really what that video was about. Imagine if the book was actually tied to a section of the library and you could only borrow it and experience it in this silo. Um, and so that's where I think libraries and we will be coming to publishers um, to talk about new models for that. Um, it's really key, I think it's way better for publishers and for rights holders, it's way better for libraries, and in the end, um, it's way better for users as well if they uh, were able to port their content to their chosen technology platform. Um, so we're, we're very interested, and if any of you have ideas around this or have been part of conversations, um, we'd very much like to talk with you um, and to see where that goes. So of course, the best silo of all, <laughs> best depending, um, is this one, which is you know, a part of Overdrive in the US. It's not the uh, case here in Canada, uh, but in the US, Overdrive does have uh, an arrangement with Amazon, and so you can actually borrow library books as a Kindle. But uh, has anyone ever done that in the US? No, so, okay. So this is what happens when you borrow a library book. We, we tried to integrate the kind of Overdrive experience so that it wouldn't be so confusing for users. And from the environment here, I can click on a download now button. It's all integrated into a single environment theoretically. The user gets their message up here that they've um, successfully checked out this book. It was the only one I could find available. Um, and you click here to download it now. So when I do that, this is what happens. I go here right away. So, and I stay here the whole time. So I get my digital library loan. You'll notice that it doesn't remind me anywhere that it was New York Public Library that paid for this book. Um, I get my library book, generic library book. I then am reminded of other opportunities to buy titles from Kindle and Amazon. I have my account, which isn't my library account. I have no way to navigate back to my library account to renew this to do anything. But I could buy more books if I wanted to at the library's expense. Um, I then have my Kindle library. It's one of many. I can purchase that book if I want to, <laughs> as they keep reminding me, um, or I can delete it from my library. And when it's um, expired, it tells me that it's not available, and I can, what does it say? The, uh, um, and cannot be opened because the login has ended. Okay, I say. I then get an email, not from the library, but from Amazon, telling me that if I'd like to keep the highlights that I added to that book in my Kindle, I can either borrow it again or, you guessed it, buy it <laughs> to get my highlights. And the library has paid for this experience. So, you know, when we think about where this goes down the road, it is a terrific experience on the th in theory to be able to give to the library's users who are Kindle users. But in terms of the library's ability to maintain a meaningful relationship to help with discovery and engagement because, of course, the, the screenshot I'm missing from this, which I wish I had had, is if I'd actually finished this book <laughs> on the last page, you know what it does, right? Do you want to rate it, tweet it, share it? So where do those links go if I tweet it? They don't go back to the library. <laughs> they go back to Amazon. So we've taken the library's user base. We've paid for the book. We've given it to Amazon. They bought other titles, which the library gets no credit for in your eyes or anyone else's. Um, and, and they've actually created then messages to send out to the world to drive links back and URLs to help with SEO with Amazon and put them back. Now, I don't mean to make it sound like some great scheme. It's not. Libraries asked for it. It's not like Amazon foisted this on them. It was a favor to libraries. 
It's just that in the end, this isn't going to be a, a, the saving grace of libraries because they have no engagement with their consumers. They're just a, a channel for free stuff. So what's the alternative? Well, some libraries, and we think a big part of the problem, and if anyone wants to kind of have a conversation around this uh, afterwards or, or disagrees um, with this at all, I'd love to have a conversation in, in the Q&A, but you know, a big part of the problem when publishers don't want to sell to libraries, libraries keep saying, but our readers are buyers. And we know anecdotally they are, but we can't show you because we keep sending them off to other places to actually buy those books. So, so we, we can only tell you anecdotally and we know how much weight an anecdote <laughs> carries. Um, so it's problematic. So libraries then have been looking at other models um, where they're putting a buy button. And I know this Toronto Public Library um, just introduced uh, a buy button. Is anyone from TPL here? Yeah. So it, you know, they just introduced a buy button in their catalog that um, has an affiliate um, link to, M to Indigo. And that's the traditional model is the affiliate marketing model. Um, wi and libraries have wanted to kind of give everybody equal airtime here and provide lots of options when they've done that. Um, but again, we're still pushing them out to a third party environment and as soon as we do, they're in that third party environment and the whole idea of staff connecting and recommending great books or even the community of readers that is fantastically large and rich at public libraries recommending great books is no longer there. So now, um, we've been looking at, well, what does an alternative look like? Do we really have to push them out to all of these other environments if we were going to have a buy button? One thing that, you know, this is a whole other conversation, but we did some uh, research with Harris Omnibus a few years back and asked uh, library users about their book purchasing habit and we compared it to that of not habits and compared it to that of non-library users. So not only did we find that library users had a substantially higher incidence of buying one or more books, but they purchased 20% more books than non-library users. What they are is just overall heavier media consumers by a large margin. So they borrow some and they buy some. Um, and you know, by various estimates, you could, if you took the numbers that came out of that survey and extrapolated, you would get to library users being responsible for somewhere between 40 and 50% of book unit sales. But again, we have no way of proving that, of capturing it, because it's all taking place in third party environments. So what's the alternative? Um, and how do we kind of bring those numbers to bear on this dialogue? Um, we think, like Toronto Public Library, that you know, it's very important for there to be a buy option um, in the public library that we have to find and calibrate a better balance between those many users who are coming to the library because it's convenient and they don't, they are very heavy, heavy media consumers so they don't necessarily want to buy everything but we know they're going to buy some things and especially when the hold queue is very long. Um, and so for those patrons that can afford it, how can we engage them in buying it to support greater purchases that will come back for those who can't afford um, those choices? Um, and so um, our, uh, the model that we're working on right now and we'll hopefully be implementing in early uh, May initially with New York Public, but then several others is actually um, a uh, white labeled, um, so a New York Public Library or a New York Public Library Foundation in the case of the library's, it's the library's choice, um, sh store just like they might have in their branches. Um, so it's a white labeled e-commerce e solution um, and that has many benefits over passing them to a third party uh, provider apart from those that we've just talked about. One is um, that we have, and you can barely see it here, but we have the opportunity to bring these two environments and the, the patrons data together from those two environments in a much richer way. Um, so, you know, here and the obvious example here is the ability to add a donation at the bottom. So you're already there, you've entered your credit card, um, your, your credit card information, do you want to make a donation? Um, we don't need to ask you for anything else. Your, your address is already on file with the library. We're not shipping you off to some third party environment. But at the same time, um, and it's now integrated into their shelves, what we call shelves for life, which is what they've borrowed, what they've bought, um, and however else they've achieved or <laughs> secured content. Um, but the other part of this is making a tighter integration, as we were saying, between the lending and the buying process, knowing that so many of our patrons do do both. Um, so in this case, we found that it, the most likely scenario is often from the hold queue where somebody is uh, like to, uh, at a certain point, if they have the means, they may just decide to, especially if they've got a book club meeting coming up, they may just decide to give up on the hold queue 
and purchased it. So now they've put a hold on it, and we're able to say to it, we noticed that you still have a hold request on this title. You know, if you don't tell us otherwise, we're going to cancel that so that another patron can get it more quickly now that you've chosen to purchase it. Um, but of course, if we'd sent them off to Amazon, we couldn't make those correlations. They'd still be in our holds queue um, unless they went and reminded it. So we're just doing what every other e-retailer um, is doing and trying to make smart use of data that users are sharing with us both explicitly and implicitly. Um, and then we're allowing them to use the library as their vendor agnostic, retailer agnostic place to hold all of the content that they're interacting with. Um, whether they borrowed it, whether they bought it, um, or whether it's um, available in public domain. Um, and to keep it on one set of shelves, as you can see here, borrowed and owned. Um, and to, importantly, we think, stay within the library's environment to read it. Um, and so it's a library branded uh, in browser reader that allows us, like every other web uh, property, to keep the user in that environment, to keep them um, so that when they search, for example, they're searching the entire library catalog, not just the ebook catalog of whichever vendor they happen to have ended up in for that particular title. Because if you go in most um, ebook environments at the library, if, I've, if I'm reading an Overdrive book and I click the search box, I only search the books that the library's purchased from Overdrive. If I hit the search box on 3M, I'm only seeing, whoops, <laughs> seeing those titles. So that's, a, you know, again, just extending the library's brand and the library's opportunity to engage. Here, I have three recommendations, three messages, ways to continue to service the patron. So that's the access piece. Um, but in addition to that, we think there are big uh, roads ahead for all of us in the areas of discovery um, and engagement. Um, so discoverability, big words, been talked about for a long time. We think the libraries have a unique role to play here. The first is that it's really not in their best interest to be promoting bestsellers, even though we find that they do <laughs> um, very frequently. But of course, when they promote bestsellers, they're um, forcing themselves to buy a growing number of titles for an inventory that will have a very short shelf life. So when you look at, for example, I'm just going to give some examples here, but you know, this is, I just went on to Calgary Public Library's website today, and you know, the first thing that's featured when you go onto the catalog page is the New York Times bestseller list, and I go, and of course is Gone Girl. Well, look, there are 527 holds on 154 copies. So I'm not going to be getting that soon. Um, and then the next title that's promoted, you know, I've got 253 copy it holds on 47 copies. Why do we want to be featuring this? <laughs> I mean, make them available, but on your homepage? So you know, w the library has an opportunity, and we've seen this in user research. It was like Netflix before it moved to its streaming model and its subscription models. We all know when you were in a queue, you prioritized what you wanted to watch, but they decided very carefully how to give you a combination of what they had available and what you had been waiting for a very long time, and they fed you in a much more kind of organic way. Um, that's really what we've seen users that come to the public library. They know they're coming in for free, and we have a very big, and uh, most catalogs doubt do now as well, ability to limit to available titles, and that's a very popular way to search. I, you know, there are two use cases. One, I don't mind getting in a holds queue, and whenever I get it, I get it. But the other is I really need a good book now. I'm going on holiday. So I want to limit it to what's available. And it's the same thing. I think pr probably most of us have had this experience going into a video store. You know, when you go into the store, you're not looking for the title that's coming back three days from now. You're looking at their shelves, and you're seeing things, and you're prompted and reminded of titles that you meant to watch five years ago. They have no less value now. They're just, you had, you're reminded because they're there and they're present physically in front of you. They're visible again. So it's really about th making things visible, reminding people in new and fresh ways, even though they're perhaps not so new and fresh. Um, and so that's really for us the next path, is exploring ways to distribute the attention um, in, uh, along those lines. So when a user logs into Biblio Commons um, now, this is a, a, a darn ugly page, but it's functional and it'll uh, get a revamp soon. But what you'll see here is the first tab is Discover, and you have, first of all, um, recently shared by users I'm following. 
So it shows you everything that users you've chosen to follow in the genres you're interested in following them for have added to their shelves. Um, and, and then it shows you available now from my For Later shelf. So it's showing you things that, you know, some time ago you were clicking through the catalog, you didn't think you'd have time or, or the inclination to read at that moment. You put them on your For Later shelf and we're showing you that they're now available and reminding you again. Um, and then of course there's staff picks. So those were central in the branch visit, no longer in the online. Um, and we're really trying to give those enhanced visibility um, in the online space again. Also just recent comments um, by the community. They tend to be broad. They're not necessarily focused on um, the, the best sellers, although they do have a higher inclination. But in the next iteration, we're actually going to be featuring recent comments for titles that are available. So everything really follows that, of saying here's some stuff that other people are finding interesting that you can get now. The other part of de um, making discovery easier in the public library environment is, ironically, I think, um, about better metadata. So, you know, librarians were the original metadata geeks. Um, they created the MARC record, and that was a long time ago. Um, but they really have been leapfrogged by a lot of what you have been doing with Onyx. Um, and, and so I think you were talking about this in, in your session, Christina. Libraries have purchased that data as kind of a bundled package because they really haven't been able to. Every library has its own integrated library system and has had to manage that data on its own. And so they couldn't do con you know, very <coughs> complicated technological mashups of various types of records or data sources. Um, because we're provider to many, we can do that. Um, and so um, have recently been experimenting with one of the big six on a, um, a new platform that will allow us to combine in the library's discovery environment, both Onyx from the ebook publisher, Mark from the print editions that the library currently holds, um, and to create this new synthetic e-record uh, for ebooks on the fly. And the library can actually specify the rules on a configurable basis that it wants to pull those in. So, you know, let's assume that um, even the, the truest or diehard cataloger would accept that the publisher has better data about the publisher um, for their record. <laughs> um, so they might choose to take that from the Onyx, um, but they might want, the, well they will want the uh, LC subject headings um, to come from their MARC record that they've chosen and added to their print edition. Um, and they might choose their description, they might choose the description provided by the publisher. Um, and so you end up with this combined record that creates uh, continuity between the print record, the ebook record, and connects it to you, which we think is a very important part. Okay, so I said that I would come back at the end and just very briefly here to how this then ties into some of the work that we're doing with schools. Um, and I think for many of you that are selling into the US, um, there, there are two words that are the buzzword. <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer? Common Core, <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> Um, so that's a big part of what we're um, working on right now with the New York City Department of Education. Uh, this is going to be very interesting. They've um, been developing, and I think everybody's been doing this, this idea that there are expert curriculum developers, and they're going to go off and find the suggested texts. For those who don't follow this, the Common Core curriculum that came out with however many states, 46 states adopting it, um, had a, an appendix B, which was the suggested text at each reading level. But they're, you know, they're little women and they're, <laughs> they're it, it's a very narrow band of text that might, that people might read from. I, I like little women as a child, but <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not it. It's just, it's a very narrow range of text. We all know that there's much more that, li that libraries um, and, and everybody could be doing in terms of bringing a broader range of text to each reading level and each assignment. So what we're doing is working with the, the DOE here on a very exciting project to basically start crowdsourcing metadata creation that starts adding common core metadata to the library's collections, to your collections, and allows educators to search it by uh, grade level, scope and sequence, subject point, um, the particular unit that they're doing, and uh, text complexity. And then to enrich it with lesson plans um, and other teaching instructables that they might want to add that they associate with particular bibliographic records. So um, that really only works when you get a very large school system kicking it off. Well, we don't even know that it will work. Um, it's a big experiment, but they're, I think they're very brave to open it up and to collaborate with the public library on doing that. Um, and then the second piece is really around bringing engagement 
um, to, of text and with text to the, the student learning environment in the online um, and doing really, again, what we found they're doing already in so many different environments all over the web. Um, so, you know, the idea of teachers creating quizzes to test for key details of a text when you could just go on Goodreads and create that quiz, you know, very easily and have it self-correcting. Um, but the best part of this, we can now get students creating the quizzes um, that they give to each other and, and start to diminish the boundaries between play and learning. Um, same thing with discussions. They're happening them everywhere else. Why not bring those same discussion environments into the classroom and around the books and into the catalog so they can be findable around the books? Um, fan fiction, a fantastic extension and opportunity for engaging um, you know, those who are inclined once they've finished a book. So those are all part of what brings us back to where we began. And um, we're excited to be there. And I'd love, you know, if any of you want to challenge any of those, uh, the, the ideas that we were talking about earlier around some of the models, I'd love to have that as much as uh, any agreement. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so that's an interesting one. Um, and when I showed those sites, I actually, that was pretty very confusing, I now realize. So it's not that we're linking out to fan fiction. The whole point is to keep people in the library environment. So we're actually developing those tools within the public library's catalog for people to stay within the public library environment. Um, and so our focus right now really is on like we even embed YouTube videos within the catalog. So if an author book talk is there or a trailer, we don't want to be taking people out because then they, they lose that opportunity to service. Now, 49th Shelf is a unique case. Um, and I think, you know, we, we know Craig, um, we, we'd like to explore possibilities um, down the road. But in general, we're really trying to say the library, mar the library has a huge user base. They haven't figured out a way to allow, it's not that users don't want to stay there, it's just that the library hasn't really given them anything to do there. They force them out. So we're trying to focus on the library environment for now. You know what? I'm so glad you asked. It's not in those screenshots, but we are, when you first choose it um, that you want to buy, it will provide an option for you to purchase it from a local bookseller and um, it knows your zip code and we'll actually suggest a map of those. Now, we, we really are keen to support the independent booksellers. You can load any EPUB, you can bring any EPUB file into it, and we're really hoping that, um, and in the limited user testing that we've done to this point, users are quite excited about the idea of having a retailer vendor agnostic place and the library seems a natural kind of completely neutral place to put stuff and keep it there for a long time. Um, so yeah, no, it'll be any EPUB file. But any EPUB that I own. Not That's right. No, no. So your anything you've borrowed comes up and shows up in the environment for as long as you have it. Then it goes to, uh, oh, sorry, to an expired tab, which allows you to revisit it, but it, it's I not. You always see it on my device. While you've borrowed it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you have an online and you're doing your library only use, use period. Yeah. Yes. Well, we have for the duration of your loan period. Oh, yeah. So I put it in there that's right. <laughs> so you'll have one reading environment that's for everything that you've owned, borrowed, might have brought in from Gutenberg, wherever else. Uh, oh yes, we, we, I mean, they'll have a notice in their new titles for on order as well as just arrived and we feature that. The problem with that is again, if we just put it up and there's no context for why we might want to direct your attention to something that you may not have heard of, we just end up with these extremely long hold queues um, before it's... Oh, that's exactly right. Yes, no, absolutely. So we will be uh, allowing if it's... Some, uh, as you may have heard, some publishers are now putting um, a, an embargo period. Um, so I believe Penguin um, in the US now is, won't provide the library new titles for six months after release. Um, so, so there are different models that are emerging and yes, there will be this interoperability between, you know, put yourself in a holds queue, buy it, 
get it, different options. Um, well, so far, we've only been working with U.S. publishers just because that's where the first opportunity came. But we have been in discussions with a number of libraries and there is, as you all know, and uh, we're just talking about an RFP out um, that we will be submitting um, you know, a proposal for um, to participate as, as a supplier in the ACP um, pilot. So in the context of that, we would definitely expect to be enriching and exposing um, much of that data. Yeah, I think it would be great not just for Canadian libraries, but it would be wonderful um, you know, to be able to feature that in, in some of our larger U.S. systems. So. so you're saying Well, we're not doing this for anyone, actually. This is all a, a new product, Biblio Digital, um, and it's been developed with support initially from New York Public Library for um, some new arrangements that they have with U.S. publishers. So we've been you know, brought opportunities by some of our partner libraries, and um, we, we've been responding to those. Um, but uh, you know, I think it will really depend on what happens and some of the um, the directions that the ACP um, decides to go. We, you know, I, I expect over time, like th something like that, we, the the basic Canadian author field is a very easy one and um, very rich for us to do. So no matter whether we were the the um, you know, participating in the ACP, that would be an easy one over time to do. It's just that right now we're receiving the Onyx feeds from the uh, publishers and we'd have to, in, in the US, and we just need to establish different feeds. But it's a big priority for us. 